This year, particularly important because it's 25 years since the scientists went to live in the biosphere for two whole years, can you imagine? And two of them actually got married. And these two went on to form one of the US's most innovative companies, Worldview, which is radically thinking the way we access space. So would you please welcome Jane Pointer and Tabor McCullum. Good evening, everybody, and we are incredibly excited to welcome you all into our home, <laughs> after all, as we lived there for so long. We were also part of the team that built Biosphere 2, and we should have some pretty pictures in a minute for you. Uh, oh, I have to make it go forward. That's what you're telling me. <laughs> right, there we go. Okay, so have all of you been out there already? So you've already seen it? You're yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, excellent. Brilliant. That's what we were hoping. So we designed the Biosphere 2 to address some sort of emerging problems that we were seeing in the early 1980s. The Keating curve, which is the curve that so shows us that CO2 is going up every year, had just been uh, published. We were seeing ozone holes. And what we didn't understand was how that affects the globe as a system. In fact, the word biosphere wasn't used in English until the mid-90s in any popularity. It was spelling that word down the phone through the early 90s. So this whole idea that the Earth is a connected system was what we were trying to understand. So we built a biosphere with a rainforest and a series of other biomes in it. Uh, but the first thing we had to do was make this structure airtight. Uh, you, the biosphere too is lined in stainless steel for three and a half acres, one and a half hectares. And there is 60 odd miles of glass edge seam around the top to make the whole thing essentially hermetically sealed, airtight, tighter than uh, actually the International Space Station. So I think of this as baby pictures of Biosphere 2. Uh, and this is baby pictures of us um, <laughs> a long time ago uh, collecting corals. So, you know, we were building an entire world. We were creating for the very first time, humanity was creating a biosphere, a biosphere that we thought of as, you know, it have, has evolved on a planetary scale and we were shrinking it down. And so we had to go and collect all of the different species from around the planet to put into the biosphere. We didn't put every species in. We put about 3,800 different species. And this was us collecting corals uh, and putting them in the biosphere uh, before we went in. Uh, and then we also had to go and collect plants to go into the biosphere. Uh, and that is a whole other long story to talk about how we actually had to design uh, the biosphere itself. Um, it was a very uh, exciting project to be involved in. And during that time, uh, Tabor and I also got to do our biosphere in training. And we got on biosphere in training by accident. This boat um, was, in fact, the ship that uh, you sailed almost around the world in. I sailed across the Indian Ocean and up the Red Sea in it. It's kind of like walking speed because it really goes very slowly. Um, and so why? Why are we sailing? What has this got to do with anything? So this, for Biosphere 2, was about us understanding what it is to be in an isolated environment because, after all, you're out at sea for a very long period of time with only a very, short, with only a very small group of people. What it also was, for me, was the very first time that I really started to understand viscerally at the core of my being that we live in this highly interconnected planet, uh, really, planet ocean, planet water. You know, when you live on the land, you walk up to the edge all the time. Here, when we were out at sea, we would leave one country and we would be sailing for a month at a time and we would end up on a completely different continent and everything was interconnected all the way around the planet. So it was a really extraordinary way to begin to experience this ball, this spaceship Earth that we live on hurtling through space. So one of the uh, actual ideas of, of uh, the Earth Biosphere 2 was also a way to take life to other planets. The fundamental unit of life is a biosphere. All life as we know it can, is within the context of the biosphere, and we have but one of them. So Biosphere 2 was meant to test the idea that we could create an artificial biosphere, a small biosphere, out of the ingredients of the only biosphere that we knew. So, indeed, 25 years ago, Tabor and I went into the biosphere to begin the first two-year mission. I am doing the uh, Queen's Wave there. Um, yep, and right. Tabor, unfortunately, has his 
arm over his face. But anyway, there we are. We were going in to test this biosphere uh, to really see, does it work? Is it possible to take a biosphere on this incredible planetary scale and, and have it uh, survive for an extended period of time? So you've seen all of the biosphere, so I'm not going to talk about any of what is in there except the part that you haven't seen, really, which is the agricultural system. Here's the farm. I was actually in charge of the farm inside Biosphere 2, so I was in charge of growing all the food. So when you think about Biosphere 2, we, we had to take care of an entire world, right? So one of the things we had to do was grow all our food. We also had to recycle our water. We also had to manage all our atmosphere. You know, in many ways, it's just really what we're having to do on planet Earth today. So here, here's our, our farm. You know, we knew at every moment where all the food we were eating from came from. We knew exactly what was in our food. You know, we were incredibly connected to our food, to the animals. You know, it took us four months to make a pizza. <laughs> and that picture on the bottom right there, that was the only room that was locked in the entire biosphere. Bananas, they are so sweet when you don't have sugar. Oh, it's like cookie jar. So one of the things we also had to do is make all our own water. We essentially drank the same water every two or three days. Uh, and that water went through a pretty complex process, but a process very analogous to uh, what that we uh, have on the earth. So we drink our water, we go to the restroom, all of those goodies, push the button button. Oh, sorry. <laughs> go to a waste recycling system. And so this system takes that brackish or black water, turns it into water that we can irrigate plants with, grow some plants in of itself. And then all that water goes back on the agriculture. The water transpires. We have artificial clouds where we condense the water out of the air. And that water was perfectly safe for drinking. We analyzed it over and over again. Uh, and so by using these natural methods, we were able to reproduce in miniature the water cycles of the earth. Life is magic because it does it for you. It's awesome. So, oh, here, this is you too. <laughs> I was also uh, responsible for the air. So between uh, Jen and I, we had food, air, and water. Uh, and I was also responsible for making sure we understood how all the chemical cycles inside Biosphere 2 worked. And one of the amazing things about Biosphere 2 was we knew how much carbon-12 there was, how much carbon-13, how much different isotopes of oxygen there was in the biosphere. So as I'm tracking these molecules as they wind their way around inside the biosphere, if I'm missing something, I know they have to be in there somewhere. And so most of the modeling we did was to try to figure out where all of those different components were inside the biosphere, which allows us to make mathematical models, which was considered at the time impossible to understand how ecology works on a mathematical level. Which is, of course, what we're doing today on planet Earth with carbon cycle mo modeling, all of the biogeochemical cycling that's going on and the modeling that's going on uh, here at the University of Arizona and at Biosphere 2 today. Um, so one of the m most intriguing personal experiences that Tabor and I had, and I think just about every Biospherian has, is that of being viscerally part of your biosphere you know, really being interconnected with it. You know, on a moment-by-moment -moment basis, we knew that we were dependent on all the plants inside this enclosure, this sealed container for the oxygen that we needed to survive. And that the CO2 that we exhaled was in part going into all of the plants and animals around us as well. And in fact, with our food supply, it was incredibly obvious because we ate so many sweet potatoes that we were in fact turning orange with sweet potatoes. So we were really becoming part sweet potatoes. So there was this enormous interchange of chemicals inside Biosphere 2. And we really got this experience of being part of the Biosphere, which of course is the way it is out here. It's just such a vast scale. I mean, it is no, not a human scale out here. That is a leap of imagination that we have to do every day to completely embed ourselves in the biosphere in the way that we did inside Biosphere 2. So we, we exchanged almost all of our body mass with the biosphere. We came out taking a piece of the biosphere with us as we come out now uh, and leaving behind that equivalent amount of mass and having processed huge amounts of energy through us, we were really part and parcel of our little biosphere. 
So we're really excited that the University of Arizona has, has uh, you know, taken on, on the biosphere and is really using it for its highest purpose to really understand uh, the planet that we all live on. Um, I'm, you may have already heard some of the amazing science that's been done out at the biosphere uh, beyond uh, our two years there. Uh, there was some back in the 90s, there was, uh, you know, scientists were beginning to understand that there was something going on with the coral reefs around the planet, and we thought it was something to do with the rising CO2 in the atmosphere. We really didn't know for sure, we as a species. Uh, and Biosphere 2 did the seminal work in the ocean there to really understand what was happening with the corals, and in fact quantified the effect of rising CO2 on our corals, which we now call souring seas, and which we now know has effect far beyond the coral reefs, and of course can affect the very bases of our food web, uh, which give us the fish that we eat uh, as well. So, so we're really excited uh, to be uh, continuing our, our relationship uh, with the biosphere, and Joaquin Ruiz, Dean, Dean Ruiz, uh, who you saw in that, that last picture, uh, was, uh, was very happy that he sort of carried the torch. So one of the things that uh, comes apparent when we talk with astronauts, like Ron Guerin is on after us, is that by living as part of our little biosphere and seeing another biosphere outside, Earth's biosphere, and having this sort of intra-biospheric communication, we would say, you know, what is our CO2 today? And they'd, outside in the Earth's biosphere, they'd say what their CO2 was today and what our oxygen was and what their oxygen was, and have a two biospheres that we could sort of compare and understand you know, we would get weather reports in the morning and in the evening, what the CO2 was and the oxygen was and temperatures. So we were really in touch with our little biosphere, and it's a very similar, it seems, experience to what uh, astronauts talk about. Uh, so we've taken this idea to a company called Worldview that uh, Jane and I and others started, and the idea is to uh, do two things, to understand our planet using high-altitude balloons, these are very extremely low environmental impact way of getting instruments into very critical parts of the Earth's atmosphere uh, for long durations to understand global change and global warming and, and the chemical balances that are occurring in our atmosphere using high altitude balloons that fly for long periods of time, uh, but also using those, uh, this same technology set to take people to 100,000 feet. And the reason we think that that's really important is a lot of what we've been seeing today is getting that visceral understanding that we live in a relatively small ball. And that's really hard to get in your day-to-day -day life, that the Earth is really relatively small, and by being 100,000 feet up, just that much up, you can see the curvature of the Earth, mm. the blackness of space, and I believe that's a very important lesson for a lot of our world's leaders to have and find a way to Envi in an environmentally responsible way, deliver that experience. Yeah, there, there was a, a moment in the biosphere that it became very clear to me that giving people a particular experience really enabled them to see the world in a very different way. And uh, I got an email from a guy who said, I get it! I finally get what you've been saying all these years. And he had walked around the biosphere and he had seen us inside biosphere too. And because he had seen from the outside, looking into this small biosphere, he had finally understood that this planet we live on is in fact a finite system, a very large finite system that's very complex with deep reservoirs, but a finite system nonetheless. And so taking uh, six people and two crew up uh, to the edge of space to be able to get this experience of seeing our planet in the way that Bucky Fuller would have called Spaceship Earth, I think is, is an incredibly uh, important thing that, that we're very excited that, that we get to work on day for day. Um, we also are using these same balloon platforms to uh, really uh, fly instruments so we can understand more about the world as well, perhaps even provide communications in areas of the world that currently don't have it, uh, which is uh, an incredibly important component of connecting the entire world as well. Uh, and uh So I, um, this is a flight that we did last year at a scale flight of our... Uh our spacecraft going up to 100,000 feet. And what's important to think about this is that we're crafting a business that every aspect of it, we think about what's the environmental impact of that? What's the environmental impact if we scale the technology that we're developing to a large scale? And I think the thing that we all need to think about that we've heard a lot about today is I don't think businesses are going to succeed going forward unless they're thinking about 
the overall environmental impact that they're having, the way we train our people, the way we educate our people. Uh, and that's really going to be the key, I think, to really seeing the future uh, and building the kinds of companies and organizations and institutions that will do well uh, going forward. We're, this is uh, looking at, from about 100,000 feet, the, uh, the lens made the earth a bit backwards on this, this one, but it's a great, great image. And then uh, after we've taken the samples we need to take, we've uh, done the, uh, the research we need to do, we fly back down and repair foil to, uh, to get the payload back down to the location that we want it to be. And the whole system is essentially solar powered. While it's flying, you put out solar arrays and the system is driven in a from the power it's getting from the edge of space. And in the same way that Biosphere 2 was, was really driven by, you know, all of the uh, biological systems inside the biosphere, this, I love it, you know, rockets fight their way against gravity. This is used as gravity. It's lighter than air. It just floats to the top of the atmosphere. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is the view that you see from there. And you're going to hear from astronaut Ron Garin in a minute, who we're uh, really, really excited and honored to have as part of our team, just really thrilled that he brings that perspective that we kind of sort of hinted at when we were in the biosphere, right? We saw the world that we all live in from the inside out. He gets to look at it. He has really been one of those few people to date who has been able to see it from the outside in, this experience that we want to give everyone. And this is the kind of thing that what you see, that, uh, the quote that, that he is here, is the kind of experience that people get when they go see the Earth from that vantage point. And we'll leave you with this short video that was taken from a flight that uh, we did last year that was imagery from the edge of space looking out across our planet and reminds us of the extraordinary beauty of this world that we live in, the abundance that we live in here, particularly in the Western world, but really across the world. is an extraordinary place that we live in. One of the things that uh, I love about this footage is that it, it's extraordinary beauty, and it's just a little video camera. This is a GoPro. Imagine if you're actually there, and the difference that you see between videos that you see or b and being there. Uh, you know, this is this is how we fall in love with our planet by seeing this incredible beauty. And I think it's only by falling in love with the planet that we're on that we really begin to understand how to take care of it. Thank you. Thank you.